I'm Susan LaPerla, the Director of Programming for the Library, and I'd like to welcome you all here this afternoon for this wonderful program that we're doing in, as part of our One Book New Canaan Community Read of In the Heart of the Sea. We've had a bunch of different events over the last couple of weeks, a few more left to go uh, today's, and then on Wednesday at noon, Lori Ifland and I are doing a book talk on In the Heart of the Sea at lunchtime, 12 noon, so if you'd like to come and join us and talk about the book, we'd love to see you there. And then on Friday evening at 7 o'clock at the high school in the auditorium, we will welcome Nathaniel Philbrick to New Canaan, which is a wonderful treat for all of us. He's going to be Skyping with the high school students in the afternoon, and then he'll come down and speak to us at 7 o'clock in the evening. Everyone is welcome. There's plenty of room in the auditorium for everyone who'd like to come. We're at about 3.50 now, so we hope for a really good turnout for him. It's really great that he can come here. But today, we're really very pleased to welcome Michael Dyer, who is the senior maritime curator, I think that might be on the screen, and a librarian, I didn't ask him where he went to library school, but I will later, a librarian at the museum. And he is in the process of writing a book about the art of the Yankee whale hunt. So he's got lots of great material and images to share with us. So that's really um, great that he's here. Uh, as I said, he is the senior maritime historian. At, in New Bedford, prior to that, he was the curator of maritime history at the Kendall Whaling Museum in Sharon. He has written articles on and curated several important whaling exhibitions, including Go a Whaling I Must and A Voyage Around the World, currently showing in the Bourne Building at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And as I said, he is writing a book on the subject of the art of the Yankee whale hunt, and that will be published later this year. So please join me in welcoming Michael to New Canaan. Thank you very much, Susan. That was a very nice introduction. Well, thanks for coming out this afternoon, folks. It's, uh, it was a very nasty day in New Bedford coming down here. It was flooded and uh, it was aw absolutely awful. Um, but I'm very really glad to see that you all came out and um, uh, we can talk a little bit about, we're going to talk a lot about a lot of stuff, actually. Um, so back in 1965, uh, Stuart Sherman, who was, the, uh, who was the librarian at the Providence Public Library, and he wrote a book called The Voice of the Whaleman. And uh, this was uh, the first sort of compilation of uh, public log books and journals held in public collections. And, uh, and Sherman was, you know, one of these great uh, mid-20th century maritime guys, you know, right up there with Edward Stackpole and Carl Cutler and... Uh, Francis Lothrop, you know, they all knew each other. They were all friends, and and uh, and and Sherman. Uh, what he said was the whole subject of logbook illustration is one which deserves proper attention, and then he didn't give it any attention at all. So, uh, it, the next book to be published on the subject was Ken Martin's uh, Whaleman's Paintings and Drawings, and Ken Martin was the director of the Kendall Whaling Museum in Sharon, Massachusetts. Anybody ever been to the Kendall? No, no, nobody ever been up to. Okay, well, the Kendall Whaling Museum was a, uh, a pretty great institution uh, that was uh, founded by the the Kendalls of the Curad Bandage Company, and and these folks uh, were really s interested in all things whaling all the time, all over the world, all cultures, and so they didn't get bogged down in the in in the historical society end of things. Uh, they collected uh, great whaling stuff from everywhere, and that's where I started working, uh, mostly because I was interested in whaling history. I wasn't interested in, in uh, uh, sort of local history uh, at all. Uh, you know, read Moby Dick, you know, 50 times, and, you know, you know everything else, and wrote my master's thesis on, uh, you know, illustrated whaling narratives, and just, you know, sort of generally wound up uh, fascinated by whaling. And uh, I had to disappoint Susan. And that was, I never went to library school. Oh. I never went to library school. Um, <laughs> uh, I was sort of default librarian. Uh, and uh, so that's all right. Um, so what I'm going to do it, uh, today is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you a little bit. And then we're going to, when I start to see heads starting to nod off, uh, then, I will, uh, then I will switch to, um, to the, I don't know, I've got like 65 or 70 slides, some ridiculous number of slides. And we can, uh, we can look at the pictures and, and talk about them. Uh, so, um, 
I'm going to read to you a little bit from the introduction to this book that I'm working on. Uh, it's um, a colleague uh, who read it, you know, sort of described it as quote unquote purple. Um, <laughs> and that's okay. After the swinging blankets of dripping blubber were minced and boiled and the smashed boats were hoisted back on shipboard with the jagged tooth of Ball's Pyramid towering 300 feet out of the far off Tasman Sea or the hump of Massafuero Island sitting on the horizon of the South Pacific like an enormous meatloaf, the American whaleman and inveterate artist sat down to draw a picture of what he had experienced on the job that day. So that gets us started. Uh, whaling was an, uh, an endlessly tedious, um, deadly dangerous, and uh, absolutely evidently uh, fascinating uh, job for thousands and thousands of people. The uh, voyages out of ports like uh, New London and New Bedford, uh, Nantucket, uh, Provincetown, uh, Bristol and Warren, Rhode Island, uh, and then some other, some other ports up and down the Hudson River that didn't do so well, Poughkeepsie and, and Hudson, uh, and, um, and there was a Newark, uh, believe it or not, um, went all over the world. And at this time, in the antebellum years in particular, being a professional mariner uh, was, was a career for, for some people. You know, if you came from Sag Harbor, for instance, or you came from Fairhaven, uh, Fairhaven, Fairhaven, or, you know, Westport, Massachusetts, you know, it's the only game in town. They were one industry towns. You know, whaling uh, and maritime trade was how, why the towns were built and settled in the first place. And so if you grew up in New Bedford uh, and, and you went whaling, uh, you could, you know, work your way up through the fishery and actually expect to be a wealthy man someday. Uh, you could own your own vessel. Uh, you could become a shipmaster. You could, uh, uh, you could retire to a farm, you know, in upstate New York someplace. And, uh, and it, was a real, uh, it was a real career goal. And uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of young men went out and actually studied they went to school and they studied navigation and they learned how to, uh, how to navigate. They learned how to keep a log book. Uh, and then there were the hundreds and hundreds of other people who went whaling that didn't, never wrote down a thing. You know, uh, Portuguese islanders and, and these, you know, these guys from Vermont and Ohio and, and Pennsylvania and New York and Maine. And they never wrote down anything. And there were thousands and thousands of them. And uh, every now and again, the right person would wind up on the right vessel with the right master, and some of these masters uh, turn up time and time again. So some of the most beautiful illustrated whaling journals that we have seem consistently to have been produced under certain whaling masters, which is a very interesting kind of a phenomenon, and I'll be exploring it quite a bit in this book. Um, but the, uh, to start with, well, I illustrate it all. Um, you know, manuscript illustration has an ancient lineage. Uh, this particular, you know, book, believe it or not, there's a copy in this library. I know, I looked it up this afternoon. Uh, this is a copy of the Hours of Catherine of Cleves, who was a Duchess of Gilder in, uh, in 1440 in, uh, in Holland. And uh, very wealthy people could, could commission these uh, liturgical text, illustrated liturgical text. And then you get somebody like Sitting Bull, who uh, when Sitting Bull had the time, uh, he sat down with colored pencils and a notebook and he illustrated his life. And then you have somebody like Joseph Bogart Hersey. Now I'm sharing the creme de la creme with you all today. You know, I, this happens to be, in my estimation, one of the greatest whaling illustrations of all time. It has, uh, you have a sperm whale being cut in alongside. Uh, you can see the spade, you know, chopping into the blanket piece of the blubber. You see the, you see the men at the, uh, at the, at the windlass up here, uh, working away. You got a guy up here on the lookout. Uh, you've got sharks in the water. Uh, you've got a ship's cat. On the boat, uh, you've got you know, all these uh, all these waterfowl 
clustered around. You've got uh, you've got the you know the blood in the water. This is a you know this is one of these great illustrations. But it was not always thus. Um, whales were often, through time, you know, perceived as being monsters, uh, or at least were were drawn that way by the people who drew the pictures. Mariners themselves knew that they weren't monsters. They knew that they were whales. Um, but by the time that the whale that the mariners got back and were talking to uh, to the people who were writing the books and to the people who were illustrating them, uh, there were mm, there were disconnects in language and and uh, and what uh, what could be described as a uh, as a fin sort of came out kind of as a as a swimming paw, and so you see you know in this this is actually a pretty great picture. It's an orca. Got the tall, you know, uh, uh, fit on his back, and he's attacking a, uh, a female whale or suckling her young. That's what orcas do. Uh, that's that's how they make their living. And uh, and I don't know. Did you all remember a couple of years back that right whale that breached over the yacht in South Africa? Remember that story? The second I saw that image, I thought of this. So whether the monsters are monsters or whether the monsters are whales, they're sea creatures, and there they are. Um, by the 17th century, however, uh, the, the Dutch in particular, uh, English, Germans, Danes, were, uh, had, had begun a commercial whale hunt in the, in the high Arctic on the east, east coast of Greenland and up around Svalbard or Spitsbergen Island. And, uh, and you can see they've got an array of animals uh, drawn here. And, uh, and in the lower right, you can see that there's a triworks and it's on shore. And these guys are, uh, they're hunting their whales up in their picture and they're chopping in the blubber and they're dragging it back to shore and they boil out the oil on shore before sending it back home. And sure enough, you've got a couple of balls whale. So those are bowhead whales, historically considered to be the, the whale. Then you've got this awesome picture of a thing called a Nordkopper, which is actually some sort of a fin whale or a rorqual of some kind, but it's called a Nordkopper, which is uh, the North Cape whale uh, for the, uh, the North Cape of New Zealand, and that is actually supposed to be uh, what we call today the right whale. And I could stand up here for one hour and talk to you about why right whales are called right whales. I have an entire another paper, and it's called Why Black Whales Are Called Right Whales. And we, uh, I'm not going to do that. You should count yourselves fortunate. <laughs> but as you can see, you know, and here's our, so here's our cachalot. Ah, there's our the great sperm whale. So... You know, if, anybody's, if anybody tells you, so if Nathaniel Philbrick stands up there and tells you the story of Christopher Hussey being blown offshore by accident in Nantucket and discovering sperm whales, you can say, wait a minute, Mike Dyer told us that the Dutch had already known about sperm whales long, long before Christopher Hussey ever got accidentally blown offshore. You can see what he says. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are. So... I am not lying to you. This event took place in 1602, and uh, it was a it took uh, it took place at Beverwijk on the coast of, of uh, the Netherlands, and this is a really really well drawn sperm whale. And why is it a well drawn sperm whale in comparison to those things? You tell me why. Right. Yes. It's a whale on the beach, and the artist can actually see it. So you're not dealing with a monster anymore. You're suddenly dealing with an anatomically correct thing, you know. And these uh, these you know Dutch fops, you know, these guys come up here, and they have nothing to do, you know. They're like little kids. They got to take their sword and stick it in the eyeball, you know. And uh, and they measure their parts, and, and they stand around, you know, and cover their noses, and and you know, and and marvel at the stink because I guarantee you it's something to marvel at. Uh, but it's a really good sperm whale. 
And, you know, when you read through Moby Dick, you know, when you read that passage in Moby Dick about how it is that, that uh, it never, they never seem to be able to capture uh, what a whale look, actually looks like, um, this is the reason why, because they wash up on the beach, you know, and if the artist gets there when it's fresh, it looks great. And if the artist gets there a week later, it doesn't look so great. Uh, and a week after that, what you've got is this sagging blob of, of uh, rotten flesh, and it's all sort of pulling back from the mouth, and it's, and it's, uh, and it's all skinny and sort of bedraggled, and then, and then the next illustration that turns up, you know, this is a sperm whale, and it looks like this disgusting sort of weird thing, monster. Um, so, it, you know, art and perception, art and perception uh, really makes a huge difference in, uh, in what we're going to be talking about today, because Yankee whaling took place thousands of miles from shore. And the only way anybody on shore knew what was going on was from pictures that they saw. And this is where things get very, very interesting. Because for some reason or other, um, there weren't that many public pictures of uh, Yankee whaling. Um, the tradition of, uh, of illustration began with the tradition of navigation and cartography and keeping a careful journal. So this is a, this is a pretty early uh, uh, journal kept by Samuel Champlain uh, while he was uh, in the company of the Spanish. And he, in the traditional maritime fashion, drew a, a picture of the harbor. And it's page after page of this. And this is important because this is how the world came to be understood. When you think about world cartography, the people who, s the voyagers who saw uh, who saw the, the, the coast of South America or who actually, you know, visited the Caribbean or Africa or the Indies uh, or, or Japan. Uh, you know, uh, these were the people who came back and helped cartographers draw the world. And so it was a tradition of, uh, of manuscript illustration. The kind of illustrations that we're going to be looking at, I know these are very, very small, and I apologize for that, um, but at the very top, is a logbook, and logbooks are the official account of a voyage. They are seldom illustrated in any useful fashion at all. They were kept by the first mate. They were legal documents. Uh, they recorded the events of the day, so what direction the wind was blowing, how fast the vessel was going, whether any whales were seen, and if whales were seen or taken, then the, then the guy would have a little wooden stamp, like the one in the lower right-hand corner, and he would stamp a whale uh, next to the entry, because let's face it, this is a whaling voyage, and the whole idea is to make money. Um, you know, whalemen were not going whaling to see, the, you know, necessarily to see the world. They weren't going whaling so that they could draw pretty pictures in their manuscripts or, or scrimshaw or ship models or any of the other things that you come to uh, museums to see. Uh, they were going to make money, and a logbook would go to the owner. And the owner would stand, sit there, you know, with a stack of logbooks, and he would go through them, and he would compile lists of uh, where whales were seen and taken that he could give to his next master who was going out. And, uh, and so the master then would have a, an actual document with which to work. But the journals get very interesting because anybody can keep a journal. And, uh, and very often what you see is that uh, ships uh, seen and spoken will be drawn in. So, uh, so Abram Briggs here, he drew all these little ships that he saw uh, one day in the Western Arctic. And uh, Joseph W. Tuck uh, of Provincetown, he actually kept an abstract. So what he did was he compiled all of his own experiences and then he abstracted all of the whaling events and drew pictures of them for his own reference. So that's what that is. And then down below, we see some scrimshaw. And um, you know, I, I really feel awful that I didn't, wasn't able to bring any scrimshaw with me today. But you all can come to the New Bedford Whaling Museum. I'm pretty sure I'll recognize every one of you if I see you coming in the door. And, uh, and if not, you can just ask for Mike Dyer, and I'll come down the hill, and we can, uh, you know, we can take a walk through the galleries and look at some scrimshaw, because I owe you that. But these pieces of scrimshaw, these busks, uh, stay busk. Anybody know what a busk is? Uh, women, uh, 
throughout the 18th and 19th century had to wear a cor you know had to wear a corset, you know, to sort of uh, uh, keep themselves nice, uh, as it were. And uh, in the middle of the corset was a slot, and you put a busk down into the this slot, and you couldn't bend over, you couldn't sort of do anything. It kept your kept your posture nice. And, and so whalemen would make busks for their mothers and sisters and, and sweethearts and wives and, uh, and carve them with all these outrageous things. I mean, our busk collection is absolutely fascinating. But these two p examples in particular are, are, are whaling scenes. And, uh, and the same thing on this, on this tooth here. I know they're tiny and really hard to see, but don't worry, we'll, get, we'll see some plenty of great big full color whaling pictures here by and by. Um, this is a title page from uh, from Seth Barlow's journal. Uh, it's not a whaling voyage. It's just a um, it's a trading voyage, and he was uh, he was from uh, Rochester, Mattapoisett area, and he must have been an absolute character. This guy, uh, he drew sea monsters, actual monsters, uh, all through his journal. His his hand was absolutely beautiful. But this is a very interesting example of a of a title page uh, to a seaman's journal that it kept for my own amusement. And then, and then there are these, which are, you know, at the height of the Yankee whaling experience uh, in the in the uh, 1850s. And the one on the left was, um, let's see, it was kept by a guy named Warren Maxfield. And the one on the right was kept by, uh, by obviously, by William A. Folger. And you know, what if you had to guess? Is there symbolism here? Is this, are these guys proud to be Americans, you reckon? Yeah, I, I think they are. <laughs> and uh, are they proud to be uh, engaged in, in, in this business that they're going on? Yeah. Sure, they absolutely are. And part of the reason for that is that maritime trade on the high seas meant commercial might and, uh, and national prowess. And so the victories, American naval victories of the War of 1812 turn up again and again and again in Yankee whaling lore on Scrimshaw uh, and little, uh, little vignettes of things drawn here and there, little references of things, because the reason why was that the Americans had beat England at their own game. And now we have the freedom of the high seas. And that means trade with China, trade with India, trade with Australia, trade throughout the Pacific. You could whale wherever you want. Uh, and, and so there's a great deal of pride uh, evident uh, in these, these two uh, title pages from these whalemen's journals. Now, uh, if you remember, I was going on a bit about uh, sperm whales and and um, uh, and the early uh, period, you know. And uh, this uh, this is uh, this is a great chart. I love this chart. I use this chart at every opportunity, because this is how the how a mariner saw our saw New England. Most voyages returning from the Pacific, from the South Atlantic, from the Indian Ocean approach the coast from the, uh, from the southwest, and that's exactly what you see here. And if you have to think about Nantucket, I mean, what a better way to view just how isolated Nantucket actually is than to see it sort of sticking out here into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, you imagine settling Nantucket 1680, 1690 in there. Uh, your Quakers, your Baptists, the Puritans hate you. Um, if you turn up in Boston, they will beat you. They will drag you behind wagons. They will cut your ears off. You keep coming back, they'll hang you. Um, you know, th this, I'm not making this up. This is, these are the facts of American history. The Quakers were more or less welcomed in Providence and Newport by Roger Williams. And so Quaker people came to Newport. They sort of settled in these outlying regions of the Massachusetts, of the province of Massachusetts. So, you know, Quakers and Baptists and other sort of malcontents wind up out here in Nantucket, wind up in, in, on Cape Cod. 
Todd and the staff coach here. And uh, you want to know why there's not a great wheat harvest on Nantucket? The same reason there's no great corn harvest in New Bedford. The, the soil is terrible. You can't, you can't farm there. Uh, and so the, the settlers in these regions took to the sea. They took to shipbuilding and, uh, and, and began, uh, began their hunt. And for the Nantucketers, uh, it was pretty obvious because they're right on the migratory path um, of the right whale. I'll get to it. There it is. The black or right whale. And I'm going to go back because um, I'm a poorly organized speaker today. Uh, but these uh, right whales have a migratory path. Uh, even today, we don't 100% understand it, but we're like 90% there. And it, it, it sort of originates down around the Bahamas and comes up along the coast and swings out comes right along the earliest whaling in, in the American colonies took place at Amagansett on Long Island when the wealthy were on Cape Cod. This was in the 17th century. The reason being that that was the migratory paths of right whales. And if you, uh, if, if you go to either place, you go to the Hamptons or you go to Wellfleet, their geography is the same, and that is high dunes. When you're on top of the dunes, you can look out and you can see miles across the ocean. And uh, that was how Yankee whaling began. See, my flow is definitely off. I'm sorry about that. Um, and so shore whaling, like what's going on here in the upper left, this is a picture drawn in the late 19th century of shore whaling on Long Island uh, that shows, uh, you know, these guys are chopping up a whale on the beach, not too dissimilar from, uh, from what was going on in, uh, in the high uh, northern uh, latitudes by the Europeans. And in the lower right is a, is a history drawing uh, by William Allen Wall of the, uh, the early sperm whale fishery colonial sperm whale fishery on the Akushnet River, so where New Bedford eventually came to be settled. And what you see there is a tri house on shore, a single masted sloop, and uh, these guys are chopping the blubber up and they're boiling it out and putting the oil into casks. Uh, and when the tide comes back in and they can float their sloop, uh, they'll be able to take that oil, uh, either, either, uh, take, it to, um, take it to Newport where it'll be loaded on on uh, merchant vessels and sent back to England or, uh, or uh, right from Nantucket on merchant vessels and sent back to, Eng uh, to England or to Newport to be manufactured into candles to be uh, traded uh, in, the, in the Caribbean. But getting back to this illustration bit, um, remember I mentioned, I mentioned earlier something about navigation and navigation schools. The, uh, By 1709, there were two navigation school, uh, navigation instructors working in Boston, Owen Harris and John Green, 1709, that's pretty early. And in 1754, some guy named John Leach from London um, kept a navigation school in Boston's nor north end near Gledden's shipyard. So Leach claimed experience of three voyages in the East India Company, and he taught, quote, Drawing as far as it is useful for a complete sea artist, as it respects taking prospects of land and surveying harbors, etc., and navigation and journal keeping in a practical method. So what we see on the right is a navigation exercise book uh, from, from the early, uh, early 19th century. Joshua Spooner of New Bedford kept that, and we have a bunch of them, and they all look like that. Beautiful calligraphy, uh, the mathematics is, uh, is uh, done exactly right, and, uh, and they learned that in school. Because as I was saying earlier, you know, there's a hope that, that pursuing maritime trades was a viable career for antebellum Americans. Um, when you're shipping out to sea, 
uh, you can, in fact, purchase at your local stationer uh, watercolors, sets of watercolors uh, for keeping, uh, keeping your, your, the drawings in your journal. And sometimes these are elaborate drawings like the ones on the table, which we'll see by and by, and sometimes they are, um, they're maps uh, that are drawn into, uh, drawn into the journals. But um, like this one here on the left, which was uh, a drawing of uh, Valparaiso, Chile, uh, which was drawn uh, about 1802 uh, by a, on a, a sealing voyage out of Newburyport. Uh, this is a very remote coast in the early 19th century, at least for Americans. And uh, the master, uh, Reuben Jones, was under instructions to chart the coast as best he could, uh, to plan further sealing voyages uh, to South America. And on the right is um, San Francisco, uh, drawn by Daniel McKenzie uh, in, the, uh, in, the 18, in the 1840s. Along the same lines uh, were, the, you know, the whalemen's experiences as things happened to them. And so very often the illustrations that you see, at least I'm hypothesizing this in, in this book that I'm working on, is that the illustrations actually matter. So the whales that are seen, uh, like uh, if, uh, very often large whales are illustrated, really big ones. Um, very often uh, if it's some catastrophic, catastrophic event, like a, a fighting whale that destroys boats or damages people uh, is recorded. In this particular instance, this is uh, uh, the, um, the canton of New Bedford uh, on the right there, approaching what's called Independence Island. And the reason it's called Independence Island is that the ship Independence of New Bedford uh, wrecked there in 1836. And, uh, and, and uh, here we are, a year later, the canton is visiting uh, this island and they went ashore and they sort of poked around and there was nothing to see but the, uh, but the journal keeper felt that it was important enough to draw this into his journal uh, in, the, in this kind of traditional fashion except that it's moved past the practical and sort of moved toward more toward uh, a, an extraordinary event. Independence Island is way out in the middle of the Central Pacific and it's not near anything at all, except when making a passage from, uh, from Hawaii to uh, New Zealand, you go right past it. And so it's a straight line from Hawaii to New Zealand, you go right past Independence Island. And so that's why it, uh, it sort of turns up, that's what, why the, the, uh, the vessel was wrecked there in the first place. It's an uncharted island. So it behooves these guys to draw pictures of the islands that they see and to record the latitude and longitude and to share that information. And that information would be shared uh, directly through uh, newspapers in, uh, on the East Coast, uh, through letters from masters to owners, and owners to the newspapers. Newspapers would publish this information. Cartographers would then take that information and plug it in to the latest versions of their chart. So you'll see charts very often it'll be, it'll say, you know, it'll say published in 1812, and then later on it'll say with additions to 1826, 1829, 1836, 1842. So it has an original chart with additions to whatever date uh, the, that particular edition of that chart uh, was. And that information was gleaned directly from Mariner's observations and illustrations. So, this is the earliest picture of whaling in North America, uh, at least the earliest one that I can find. And, uh, and this, was, uh, this is some sort of a whaling scene that, that took place probably around Provincetown about 1817. Uh, it appeared in an almanac, Lowe's Almanac, uh, published in Boston. And so this is, uh, this is uh, I included this one just for some historical background uh, as we go forward. It's a woodcut. The whale is questionable, it looks like a big minnow um, the, uh, you know, you can see that the man in the boat, in addition to having that gigantic harpoon, the guy behind him has an axe. Now, wh what do you think he's going to do with that axe? He's going to cut the line just in case 
he has to. So there's no guarantee that you're going to actually be able to kill the whale. Um, so he's got that giant harpoon, and he's getting ready to stick it into the whale, um, but he's got his axe handy just in case he has to cut the line. So here's this picture that we, we discussed this already. Notice, you know, very, a couple of important things about this. Uh, this has nothing to do with the topic at hand, but I'm just going to point these out to you. You've got a black man and a Native American. Um, from the earliest references uh, in, to, uh, in, in, in American whaling, uh, people of color uh, and Native Americans have been involved in whaling forever, always. Um, they, it's um, just sort of the way it is. Um, some were free blacks, some were slaves, um, even slaves of Yankee, um, Yankee whaling agents, you know, began giving up their slaves in the latter half of the 18th century. Um, but there were plenty of, of um, sort of indentured um, black sailors, you know, or even slaves who shipped on board Nantucket whalers and, and, uh, and they were paid or their owners were paid and they gave their shares to their owners. Um, but uh, Native Americans uh, are, are run all through this whole story, um, right up to Amos Smalley. Uh, Amos Smalley in uh, 1902 uh, actually killed the albino whale. He killed Moby Dick. Um, and I think it was on board the, the, uh, the Kathleen, maybe, the Kathleen of New Bedford. Um, and Amos Smalley was a gay head Indian. And so here we go. This is an ad from 1797. Wanted immediately a Cooper, also a man capable of heading a boat and two or three good black men for the sloop Nancy bound on a whaling cruise. Um, so sloops like that would be cruising down to the Caribbean uh, relatively close by. And so this is, a, this is a great American story across the board. So here's the black or white right whale as we saw earlier. These are a the, uh, couple of illustrations uh, from uh, whalemen's journals. Um, Do I have the guys? Doesn't seem like I have the guys. The one on the bottom was drawn by a guy named um, Dean C. Wright on board the Benjamin Rush of, of uh, Rhode Island in uh, 1841. And the one on the top was drawn a little bit later in the 1850s by a fella, and I forget his name, but it was on the Dr. Franklin of Westport, uh, Massachusetts. And he did a very interesting thing. He sketched all the species of whales that were commercial species. He sketched them all, and he wrote out his own descriptions in his journal of, uh, of these animals. So that's, um, these aren't dumb guys. You know, they're not, you know, if, um, you know, the idea that whalemen are illiterate uh, and whatnot is uh, only partially true. You know, one of the great things about Yankee whaling um, is that there were 15,000 Yankee whaling voyages, 15,000 voyages. On average, because some of them, there were plenty of sloops, little sloops, and there were plenty of big ships with up to 35 guys on board. We'll call it average maybe 28 people. So if you multiply 28 times 15,000, what do you get? A lot of guys. You get a lot. <laughs> you get a big number. Anything that you can imagine to, could take place in the human experience, anything that you can imagine took place from oceans the whole world around, from the Western Arctic the whole way to the Indian Ocean, uh, murder, mayhem, uh, absolute uh, beautiful profit-making voyages, beautiful artworks. Uh, it's it's just astonishing the panoply. So, you know, one of the one of the habits that I try to break myself of is ever try to use. I try not to use the collective they, saying they did this, they did that, they did the other thing. Because sometimes somebody did, and sometimes somebody didn't. Um, it was uh, it was an amazing array of human experience. This happens to have been drawn. This is a right whaling picture, very unusually unusually excellent right whaling picture. Uh, that was drawn uh, on board the first voyage of the Charles W. Morgan. Um, and uh, as you know, the Charles W. Morgan is sailing up the East Coast this summer. 
And uh, if you get the chance, come to New Bedford in early July, late June, early July, and actually see the Charles W. Morgan will actually sail back into New Bedford Harbor for the first time since 1922. It's a great event. You're going to go? <laughs> so here's, um, here's uh, Dean C. Wright, once again, you know, has drawn the great sperm whale. Now this is the creature that, uh, upon which fortunes were made, and this is the creature that, that, took, uh, that took the Essex into the Pacific. Uh, and, uh, and here, this isn't the Essex per se, this is some unidentified uh, whaling vessel, but uh, there, in the Whaling Museum in New Bedford, we have a collection of uh, drawings by, we simply call him the anonymous whaleman artist. And, uh, and they're absolutely extraordinarily good, but this is a great image because it has none of the bells and whistles that you will see on the Charles W. Morgan and none of the bells and whistles that you will see on the ship model of the Lagoda, the largest ship model in the world that sits in the Whaling Museum in the Bourne Building. Has anybody seen this? Yeah, you've seen this thing, so you know it's a pretty extraordinary thing. But it doesn't look like this. No deck house here. We've got a few, three boats on davits on one side of the vessel with no cutting stage and no deck house over the tri works. There's no chimney on the tri works. Uh, there's no break windlass. Uh, the windlass is a pole windlass that was moved uh, by uh, sticking big, heavy pieces of oak into holes in the windlass and then heaving, heaving. So when you hear that song, heave a pole, oh, heave away, uh, that's what they're talking about, heaving, uh, heaving at the windlass. And this was the job of, you know, the lowest of the low uh, green hands on shipboard. These, I've included these for a very good reason because as we go through, we're going to see a lot of illustrations and you will be amazed at how similar they look to these. These are the first two prints, whaling prints, published in the USA. And they were published in 1835, which is pretty late in the game for American whaling. Uh, it's a good 100 years. Uh, better than that into the into the into the fishery, and these were published by um, these were uh, uh, w the one on the left was painted by uh, William Page, and the one on the right was painted by Thomas Birch. Do these names mean anything to anybody? William Page and Thomas Birch, two of the great two of America's greatest painters at the time, were in New York, and this whaleman Cornelius Hulsart uh, uh, was from New York. And he went whaling on a New London voyage. And while he was on the voyage, he, uh, he lost an arm uh, in uh, battling a sperm whale. And when he got back to New York, here he is, this one-armed whaleman. And, uh, and he, uh, he wrote a little pamphlet. He was trying to make some money. Uh, and he wrote a little pamphlet of his adventures. And evidently, he, he must have had sketches of whaling with him, which is not surprising. Um, and these look exactly like the less formal uh, whaling illustrations. As we go along, we'll, we'll look at them. Like some of these, for instance, by the anonymous whaleman artist. They don't look at all dissimilar, you know, from this. You've got cutting in, you've got this Amazing picture here. <clears throat> Common practice in the, in the whale fishery was for uh, was to harpoon a calf in order to get the uh, the mother, and so uh, you harpoon the little one, and the mother comes to the rescue, and then you get the mother. So that was common practice. But as you can see from a number of these uh, uh, pictures, especially the two on the on the extreme right, uh, the whaleman the whale fought back. Uh, and there was a, a great tragedy in the whale fishery. Uh, a lot of whales escaped. Uh, a lot of whales were killed, uh, like the one uh, uh, on, the, on the upper left there. And then, um, and, you know, and you can see an extremely successful whaling scene in the top middle, and then cutting in the blubber, the blanket piece, on the bottom middle. Is that clear to everybody? This is a fabulous thing. Uh, in the Siemens Bethel in New Bedford, which was a whaler's, uh, a seaman's boarding house. They had a big book, and you could sign the book, uh, 
like a you know just like any kind of a uh, a hotel ledger, uh, except these guys went overboard with their graffiti, and uh, and uh, you know they I, I I like to include this just because I think it's a really really neat thing. Hope is the anchor of the soul. You know that's the you you know we've all seen images of these crusty old sailors with the anchors you know tattooed on their arms. Well, th there's a tradition of that, uh, and it uh, it goes way way back in maritime communities, and that is that hope hope is the anchor of the soul, and this is what kept communities together when men and boys would ship out on some long voyage somewhere. This idea that they that they will come back um, is ingrained, and you see it time and time again in all kinds of artworks. This is a nice picture of a, of a launching of a ship at Fairhaven. <laughs> so here we see this is jo Joseph Tabor's journal kept on board the ship Rodman of New Bedford, uh, 1828 to 1830. This is as close an illustration as we're going to get, uh, really, to uh, the period when uh, the Essex was at sea. Uh, there's a there's not a lot of illustrations from the first quarter, really, of the 19th century. Just like there's not a lot from the last quarter of the 19th century. The real bulk comes in the middle. Um, but this is a this is a, a very interesting scene. There are in this guy's journal, he records uh, whales all the time, and ships spoken all the time. But he doesn't include the whaling scenes very often. And in this particular, as a matter of fact, doesn't include them at all. Uh, in this particular uh, drawing, the, there are two whales that are getting away. They just plain get away. And I think he was so astonished by that that he actually had to draw it into the journal uh, because there's uh, the. The Lima of Nantucket, which is uh, the vessel shown um, broadside, uh, and his own vessel, the ship Rodman, all lowered boats, and they were all chasing these two whales. So there's one. There's the other one. And you can see from the, the fact that they're sloops drawn on the margin that these are whales that got away. So uh, very often you'll see a full whale uh, like the one on the bottom there, where the whale was captured, and flukes where the whale got away. Um, this, all, this all took place on the, on the Japan grounds, and the Japan grounds is a fairly um, deceptive kind of a thing because it's, this, it's, it's the size of continental North America between Hawaii and, um, and Japan. It's this enormous uh, space of ocean. Uh, but it was full of sperm whales, and it, and it was, uh, Yankee whalers began turning up there in the 1820s. Uh, and that's, um, you know, these, uh, these three pieces of scrimshaw on the right were drawn by a guy named Frederick Myrick, and they're Susan's teeth. Uh, they're among the most famous uh, 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 scrimshaw that there is of the ship Susan of, of, uh, of Nantucket. And uh, how are we doing? Yep. Yeah. Right All righty. Keep talking. Here it is. Thank you. Yep. Uh, what made him famous was the drawing was famous, but the fact that he made so many of them and they're all exactly alike and he kept giving them to people. But he also had this famous little phrase that he would write. Uh, and it's death to the living, long life to the killers, success to sailors' wives, and greasy luck to whalers. And so that couplet turns up, uh, you know, in, in 20th century histories all the time. Uh, you, you see it, and that's where it came from. It came from these pieces of scrimshaw. Death to the living, long life or long live the killers, uh, success to sailors' wives, and greasy luck to whalers. Uh, the more you say it over and over to yourself, the more kind of intense and weird it gets. Uh, it's a really kind of an extraordinary thing, and it says a, a lot about Yankee whaling. Success to sailors' wives and greasy luck to whalers. And here's Oliver Wilcox whaling on the Japan grounds on the ship Canton in 1835. And these events, uh, these events, you know, were extraordinary events, and they actually took place. And, uh, and he records them in his journal. Um, uh, 
This is the action, the top illustration, is the action on May 3rd, 1837, where three whales were taken, one boat completely destroyed, another slightly damaged, and three whales lost as the harpoons pulled free or broke or the whale line parted. Um, so that's Yankee whaling from the eyes of the guys who were doing it. And it was going on on the Japan grounds way out in the, in the northwest Pacific. Makes my job easier uh, because I can actually figure out which whales were killed or were about to die, and so it uh, you know I can when you when you encounter an illustration like this sometimes it's in the back of the journal uh, and and then you have to sort of read through the entire thing in order to figure out what event is actually taking place. But if you work on the hypothesis on the assumption that it is an event uh, that's taking place, then uh, then it makes your job easier when you try to actually identify it. Uh, this is another uh, set of illustrations from whaling on the Japan grounds. These are drawn by, uh, by a man named Gould. I think it's Oliver Gould. Uh, on the ship Columbia of Nantucket in the mid-1840s. And so you see super successful whaling here. You see some really, really big whales. And I'm absolutely convinced that these are not exaggerations, that when, they, when he draws these in, these are gigantic sperm whales, uh, you know, upwards of 90 barrels, you know, maybe as, as large as 100 barrels. Um, and so... The, And pride of, you know, pride of the ship. So, you know, we, we saw uh, William Folger's uh, title page. And I don't know what the relationship between the master Folger and, uh, and William Folger is. I suspect there is a relationship. They're coming, both coming from Nantucket. But, you know, they, uh, the, the vessels themselves turn up frequently. Uh, this is the Parker Cook, for instance, drawn by Joseph W. Tuck, Parker Cook of Provincetown. Look at the size of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, the top sails. You can really spot, um, you could spot Art and Scrimshaw from a certain period uh, because after a certain time, after the 1850s, uh, it became economical to take the topsails and split them in half. And so you see split topsails. And before then, you see these gigantic full-size uh, topsails. This is the ship Arab of Fairhaven, drawn by Ephraim Harding. And this is the St. Peter of New Bedford, lowering boats for whales. Uh, I love this picture. You know, he, the, the, the artist is a man named James Carter, and he, uh, he, he, he really captured uh, the, the event really well. You see the boats are in the water, and then the men are lowering down, so they're they're actually jumping down into the boat. So, you know, when Melville describes that in, in Moby Dick, uh, it's a pretty accurate description. You can see there's one guy on the lookout up there with his spyglass. And he's not standing in the rings. He's not standing in masthead hoops. There's just one guy up there, and he holds on for dear life. And the same thing here. This is the ship navigator of Nantucket. If you have to have one picture in your head of what the Essex looked like, this would probably be it. This was actually removed um, from the journal. Uh, it was in the Kendall collection, and the journal uh, was in the Kendall collection as well. But uh, w during the course of my research, I was able to take that, recognize that this 
art looked very similar to the art that was in the journal and was able to put them back together and figure out exactly the page where this was removed. Um, it was removed and, and framed. I don't think it was, I think it was removed ages past uh, because they were acquired at very different times. And here's a, uh, the George and Susan of New Bedford uh, on a whaling, uh, uh, sperm whaling. This was drawn by the master, actually, uh, Alexander Howland, 1845. You'll notice the triworks going full blast and that there's no, uh, there's no chimneys on those triworks. Um, see, yes, well. Now this is, an, this is a great thing. This one's actually on the table here. This is the Arab of Fairhaven, uh, Ephraim Harding, and the re there's not, there are not a lot of illustrations in this journal, and this scene is extraordinary because Harding writes in the journal that he sailed the whole way from Fairhaven across the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic and around, uh, around the, the Crozets and around the, the Cape of Good Hope and into the Indian Ocean, and he didn't see any sperm whales the whole time that they were that they were sailing, and that when you get to the Gulf of Amman, they run into this giant school of sperm whales, and they killed 11 out of 14 animals, uh, and, uh, and, and processed, uh, they were able to process nine or 10 of them. Um, and so that's what you see going on here, you know, is this, this great event. You know, if you're Ephraim Harding, you're a whaling master, this is a great thing, you know, because uh, this is what you want to see. There's a lot of sperm whales, and uh, you're killing a bunch of them. And you can see the guy at the masthead up here. He's waving this thing that looks like a badminton racket, um, and uh, it's it's actually a kind of a, it's just a, it's just a, uh, a piece of round wood mounted on the end of a pole, and he's directing the boats as to where to go, where the whales are. Because when you're down in the in the ocean, you can't see where the whales are, but he's you know 100 feet up in the air, so he can see. So this one we've seen. This again is uh, James Carter on the St. Peter of New Bedford, uh, fast to a sperm whale. You can see that there's two harpoons uh, in the whale. Uh, that was standard practice uh, in case one of them pulled loose. You see what I'm talking about, about the two harpoons? I'm going to cruise through some of these fairly fast here. This one, yeah, this again. This is George Gould drew this one too. George Gould. Um, this was this was kept on board the Columbia. This is not the Columbia. This is another whaler altogether. Um, but this is showing you know this is the most desirable you know sort of uh, thing that you can see. You know you've got three boats down, th and they're taking three whales. Uh, and so you can tell, you know, Gould always drew the blood in the water, so you could tell, you know, uh, what, uh, the, that, they, that they've got just about three dead sperm whales. This is pretty great. This is a really interesting thing. Um, Steve and I were chatting earlier. You know the Malaysian airliner that's down and they're ever, you know, I'm sure everybody knows about this story. They're searching uh, for this Malaysian airliner. Well, that search is taking place about 500 miles east of where that um, where that drawing was made. So they're they're right whaling in the uh, in the Indian Ocean, um, about 1,500 to 2,000 miles off the coast of Australia, and uh, that's where. Um, that's sort of the, the region where, uh, where the search is going on now. The picture on the bottom is actually held by the, the Peabody Essex Museum, or as the, the, uh, and it's a, it's a separate artwork, but it's by the same, by the same person. And, uh, and the, the one on top is the only illustration in the whole journal. Notice the twin spouts of the right whale. And the, the colors are just are absolutely gorgeous. You know, these watercolors, uh, they, they kept their, um, they, they're very, very rich, and they, 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 they kept their color over, you know, all these, uh, over 150 years. Uh, 
Joseph Bogart Hersey of Provincetown drew this, uh, this schooner trying out. You know what I mean by trying out? No? Well, you can, okay. You can see there's a fire going on and there's smoke. So um, when, when you're cutting in a whale, let's see if we can get to one. Got a lot of whaling pictures here, probably too many. <laughs> Let's see if we can find a, a good one. Okay, so when you're cutting in a whale, like, um, like these two pictures of the canton here, uh, it, it, the whale's tied up alongside, the men get over the side with spades, they chop into the blubber, uh, there's a big hook, and the hook is attached to the windlass. Uh, the hook is attached to ropes that are attached to the windlass, and then the men heave at the windlass and they drag this blanket piece of blubber up and then it gets chopped up into pieces and put into the triworks. And it was the triworks that really made American sperm whaling profitable. Uh, because all that whaling that was going on uh, on shore uh, meant that you had to kill whales and drag them back to shore and then process them. But once you were able to put two iron pots in a brick furnace and build the whole thing on the deck of your ship itself, then you could go to sea and you could process the blubber right at sea, boil it down into oil. And, um, and that's what's going on uh, in that picture, except that it's a little schooner. We'll cruise back there quick. It's a little schooner, and it's in the, uh, in the Caribbean somewhere. Yeah, so it's a little schooner. It's down in the Caribbean. Yes, sir? Wood to start, and then after a while, after you boil the oil out of the fat, you reach into the pot with a with a, a blubber hook, or not a hook, a, um, a a strainer, and you pull the fat out and throw that right in the fire. So, like for instance, if you fill up a pan with with uh, with bacon, and you cook it all down, uh, and you take you know, you just cook it until it's all black and burned, and you take that out, uh, that's what you would use then, throw into the fire in the triworks. So wood to start, and uh, wood and water were the two reasons that Yankee whalemen explored so many places in the world, because they had to go ashore for fresh water and firewood, and they went ashore everywhere. This is right whaling in the Western Arctic. How do I know it's right whaling? Well, it's got that big head of bone there hanging on the, off the side of the vessel. And you can see the way the vessel's all sort of heaved over to one side. Um, when I say a head of bone, the uh, whale bone, baleen, uh, in the mouths of right whales and bowhead whales had a great commercial value for all sorts of stuff. Collar stays, corset stays, especially after the Civil War where, uh, where women's hoop skirts, uh, those big hoop skirts, uh, had to, uh, the, the fashion demanded that they, that they, that they be all sort of hoop-like, and, uh, and the baleen was, was what made the hoops, and it, it drove, I mean, there were, there were dress manufacturers in Indiana and Ohio and places all, all around the U.S. that used, uh, baleen from, uh, whales in the Western Arctic. That's what sustained the fishery after, really, after the American Civil War. These are just beautiful illustrations of sperm whaling, you know, if you're into this sort of thing. I guess you got to be a little bit, you know, crazy to be into it this much that you're actually going to write a book about it. There's a stove boat. This is the Lucian of Wilmington, Delaware. So even Wilmington, Delaware sent off uh, whaling voyages. And these are little little stories. So here he is. He's recording that um, you know they're they're going onto an 80 barrel uh, sperm whale, and then in the bottom picture they're going onto a 50 barrel sperm whale. So these are you know these are these are remarkable events, and this is a really remarkable. This is Joseph Washington Tuck of Provincetown. Uh, you know some of the greatest whaling art uh, ever drawn by anybody uh, was uh, came from Provincetown. Uh, Hersey and, and Tuck in particular. 
as I was saying earlier about Joseph uh, Tuck keeping abstracts, that's what, uh, that's what this is. This is not his journal. These are extracts from his journal, illustrated extracts. And you can see the boats up um, in the top picture. Uh, they're, they're going onto the whale under sail, so they're actually sailing down onto the sperm whales before they get fast, whereas the ones below, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're moving in for the kill in that particular illustration. This picture on the bottom is really extraordinary because believe it or not, Yankee whalers hunted humpback whales throughout the entire history of the whale fishery from the 17th century right up to the 1920s, uh, but nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about it. It doesn't appear in the histories. It just, it's sort of ignored. It just like it didn't happen. And there's almost no illustrations of it. So this picture uh, on the bottom, um, drawn on board the uh, Barton Napoleon in New Bedford in 1870 in the Pacific uh, is, a, uh, is a really valuable uh, sort, of a, uh, sort of a document. Classic Nantucket sleigh ride. And here's an event where the, where the, uh, the whale got away. WB waste boat. Um, these little, uh, these little symbols, you know, the, the, uh, the bow boat, the, the, the waste boat, the, um, the, uh, the starboard boat, you know, all have their little symbols and, and, uh, and it actually helped the accounting who could keep track of, of which boat took which whales because they could get a bonus at the end of the voyage. So I've been going on for a pretty long time here. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Um, you know, this is another of these events. You know, this, this entire journal has no whaling scenes drawn in it at all, except for this one, um, where the story is that they lowered for this sperm whale, and, uh, and it fought back. And it, uh, it bashed up a bunch of people. And it destroyed uh, one of the boats. And then the starboard boat goes on and, uh, and actually uh, kills the whale. But in the meantime, here, here, here it is. And on the first scene and the second scene. And so this is an extraordinary event that this, that this guy is witnessing. His name is Benjamin Boudry. And he was on board the ship Arnolda of New Bedford. And this whole journal has come under great scholarly scrutiny because Benjamin Boudry kept a list of books that he had on board. And you know what he had on board? Moby Dick. <laughs> he, he had a copy of Moby Dick with him. And uh, Dennis Marnin from the Houghton Library at Harvard has spent a great deal of time studying Benjamin Boudry. So there's a whale that got away. So that's, a, you know, that's another of these cutting in pictures, right? So you got the sperm whale alongside and they're dragging up the blanket piece. You know, you get a little glimpse of the things like, you know, the guy's laundry in the rigging. <laughs> lots of details, you know, lots of details. You can see the waif on the, on, the, on the foretop just sort of leaning there. Uh, and the man on the lookout, he doesn't have his waif with him. But there's a lot to learn, you know, about the layout of these vessels from, from these illustrations. And, and a lot to learn about how, the, uh, how, the, the, you know, how they actually went about their business and how the fishery worked. And here's a true specimen of a New Zealand whale. Big whale. And there's New Zealand itself. The guy who drew this was not a whaleman. His father was. He was on shipboard, and, uh, and he was just simply surveying uh, New Zealand. And so throughout this whole journal, the whole time this vessel's cruising on New Zealand, he's keeping track. He's drawing, uh, he's drawing maps of Akaroa, uh, the North Island, uh, maps of the South Island, and this beautiful illustration of the South Island. Um, Daniel McKenzie, Jr.,
And here's a picture of the Samuel and Thomas and Annabon Island off Africa. Um, Atlantic whalers love to go to Annabon Island because it was too small for the crew to desert. Um, they, they, they could catch them every time. And the natives uh, that lived on Annabon Island actually, you know, they, they got paid for returning deserters. So um, as did many, many native people throughout all around the world, they would get paid for returning deserters. So it, it behooved, uh, it behooved, you know, Melville to run away quickly into the hills of the Marquesas uh, rather than get captured and brought back so that his, uh, his captors could claim their reward. But here they are, you see, Casks. So they're going to Annabon for fresh water and probably firewood too. Um, boy, you know, I've been going on for better than an hour now. Who? I'd be willing to stop. <laughs> it's entirely up to you. I tell you, um, this is an extraordinary, this is actually kind of a neat thing. This guy, Francis, we've had this painting in the lower right. We've had this painting in the collection in the Whaling Museum for for decades. And it was always assumed, well, nobody ever knew anything about it. And this is one of the beautiful uh, results of bringing the Kendall collection to the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And that was that we have Francis Marion Shaw's journal uh, that he kept on board uh, the ship William and Eliza of New Bedford. Uh, William Whitfield was master of the William and Eliza. This matters because on the, the previous voyage, William Whitfield was master of the ship John Howland of New Bedford when Manjiro Nakahama was rescued. A castaway Japanese fisherman was rescued in the North Pacific and brought back to Fairhaven. You know this story, uh, man, the Manjiro story, a famous story. He was the first Japanese person uh, ever to, uh, to visit the USA as far as anybody knows, and he learned English. And he went back to Japan and managed to not be killed because it was against the law for any Japanese person who left Japan to come back to Japan. Uh, but he, he did, and he was an extremely valuable guy because when Commodore Perry turned up, he was the only person who knew English. And so he was a translator for the Perry expedition to Japan. And so rescuing Manjiro was a huge deal. Uh, actually, it turned out to be a huge deal in history. And so Francis Marion Shaw is just some guy. I mean, he was really nobody special on shipboard, but he got to be, he became steward. He was steward on shipboard, and he got in tight with the master, William uh, Whitfield. And he borrowed Whitfield's copy of Lord Anson's Voyage to the Pacific. directly from Anson. There's a whole bunch of illustrations that are traced directly from Anson. The picture in the lower left, Whitfield actually requested that he draw a picture of the John Howland at Emeo Island in Tahiti. And so nothing to do but Shaw gets Evidently, William Whitfield had a copy of James Wilson's voyage to the Pacific in 1792, and, and he copied the background of Emeo from the illustration, and then with Whitfield's tutelage, he drew a picture of the John Howland. Later on, he painted the painting, and it, and it wound up in the Whitfield estate. So this is a really, really kind of an interesting a uh, way that, uh, that you can uh, do some documentation that these you know, kind of collections actually matter. And this is another guy. This is an entire another paper. This is a chapter I'm working on on Benjamin Russell. I'm not going to go into the whole thing on Benjamin Russell. But he's a, he's a pretty interesting artist. Uh, he, was a, uh, he was from uh, one of the first families of New Bedford, settler, the first settlers of New Bedford in the 17... 50s with a Quaker family, the Russells, and, and they, they were whalemen, whaling agents, they were uh, merchants, and come to, uh, he was very successful, sat on the board of the bank in New Bedford, the commercial bank, um, and uh, come to uh, Jacksonian banking crisis of the 1830s, other banks called in their credit, and, uh, and he went bust. His whole family went bust. Uh, they lost everything because they were rich in real estate but not in cash. 
And so he had nothing to do, but Ben Russell has to go whaling, <laughs> which he did. And he was an artist. He kept a sketchbook. At least it said in his obituary that he kept a sketchbook. And he goes on this voyage. The same time that Melville was out in the Pacific, Benjamin Russell was there too. And, uh, and when the Charles W. Morgan was cruising the Pacific on her first voyage, Benjamin Russell was out there. And he drew, you know, this, uh, this is, this is uh, one of his uh, paintings of a sperm whaling scene. You know, a really great thing. Does it look familiar? I mean, does the, do these artworks kind of start to look alike after a while, don't they? Um, they have a, th there's something to them. And then later on, he created the panorama. So the grand panorama of a whaling voyage around the world, America's largest painting. It's 1,250 feet long and 8 feet high, and we still have it at the Whaling Museum. Uh, and they, he traveled this panorama. It was, a, it was like going to the movies. The thing was on a, on a wheel, and it would just sort of scroll across in front of you, and you would come in here, and I'm Benjamin Russell, and my panorama is sort of cranking around in the background, and I'm telling you all about whaling around the world. And this took place you know, between 1849 and about 1853. He went all over the place with his panorama. He didn't make much money on it. But, um, but this, this is a scene you know, from the panorama. And again... It looks kind of familiar. This is actually a formal painting. Yes, ma'am. Are you struck by the difference in scale between the depiction and the portrait? I mean, I was looking at the front of this, and the description is kind of funny and peculiar. It seems like the ships really do evoke something in the artist. Um, it's hard to draw. Yeah. I think so. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's their floating home. And uh, and that the ship sort of represents not only their home but their livelihood. Um their the ship is very often flying an American flag, so there's a patriotic sort of connection to to what it means to be on this ship in the middle of the sea doing this job. Does that help? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, well, I'll start with the last one first. Um, one third of all the oil produced from a sperm whale comes from the head. So if it was a 30 barrel whale, 10 barrels came out of the head, and the body produced 20. So it was about a third. And that was spermaceti, which was the really valuable stuff. They didn't have to boil that out. You have to, what you do is you turn the head. Uh, upside down and you cut a hole in it and you bail the spermaceti directly out of the head. Um, the second question about the harpoons, the idea is to get them behind the hump. So the hump of a sperm whale, let's see. It's not like we don't have lots and lots of sperm whaling pictures to choose from. Let's get back to... Um, So there you can see exactly where the harpoon goes. And in a lot of these illustrations, that's where they're aiming for, uh, is right around the hump. Although here you see it's in, it's in the middle of their back. It's ahead of the hump. So the hump, the, bi the big hump, here, here they got back up a little further. And what was your first question? Oh, any part where the oh. Yankee whalemen didn't eat whales. And sperm whales are largely inedible anyway, although the Indonesians uh, eat sperm whales. Uh, that's part of their mm, daily diet. Uh, there are islanders in Lamalara that have a sperm whale fishery that goes back forever. Um, and uh, they eat sperm whales. But uh, sperm whales, uh, sperm whale is not an oil, it's a wax. It's, ca it's categorized as a wax. Whereas all other whales, um, well, not all other whales, um, all the mysticetes and the rourke whales are actual oils. And so they're edible. Right whales, bowhead whales are edible. Um, that was what sustained the, the modern whale fishery uh, was blue whale meat. Um, blue whales and fin whales, you know, those animals are edible. Sir? I, I recall uh, when I was a boy, I grew up in New Bedford, by the way, which is a very few 
at the hotel. They still had rail plates on the money. Is that right? Ah, I wonder what they were. I wonder what kind of whale they were. Hey, you folks have been really patient and a really good audience, and I appreciate your sticking around for an hour and a half of, uh, of, of this thing. So if, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer them, and if not, have a lovely evening. Yes, sir. Well, when the men were on the lookout would spot a whale, they would holler. Um, there she blows, there goes flukes, there she breaches, whatever it was that they hollered. And then the master would make a decision as to whether to lower or not. And if the conditions were right, uh, the vessel would, uh, would either heave to or, or turn into the wind, and they would lower the boats, and away they go. Not necessarily, the whales could be anywhere. The whales could be anywhere. And that was why it was so important for the, the guy at the masthead to be directing the boats as to where to go, because he could see them. Yeah. I'll tell you what, let me, this gentleman back here. Um, are there any cases of whales? Wow. Um, there is historical evidence yes that on the that on the coast of Persia there was ancient shore whaling in Persia very little evidence that the Chinese ever hunted whales at all very little evidence but the Japanese have been doing it forever forever as a matter of fact the earliest there are two very very early these are prehistoric um, sites one is on the Korean Peninsula and one is in Norway that actually shows people in boats with harpoons hunting whales. You're a masochist. You're going to buy my book, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, yes, sir. No, when it was when a whale was um, the idea is you get put the harpoons into the whale, right? That means your your boat is fast. So your boat is fast to the whale. You go on a Nantucket slow ride, sleigh ride. The whale starts swimming off, towing the boat along behind. the 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 crew, when the whale starts to slow down, starts to haul in on the line. So they haul in on the line and they get close, so that the the boat header in the stern switches places with the harpooner. The boat header in the stern is the most skilled whaleman on board next to the harpooner. And so it's his job is to kill the whale. So they switch places, and then the boat header takes a tool called a lance. And a lance, uh, it, it, uh, it's very long, and it has a pedal-shaped head that can go in and out razor sharp. And so they haul up onto the whale, and then he lances the whale, um, and, uh, and if he does it right, if he gets into that spot deep, what's called the life of the whale, where all the blood vessels come together between the heart and the lungs, he gets in there and he cuts all those arteries with his lance, then the whale will bleed, will spout blood. And, uh, and that is, that's an animal that's about to die. And they, uh, the phrase, the language is, uh, he spouts thick blood or spouts thin blood. So a whale that's spouting thin blood is not ready to die yet. Um, and it, they, need, it needs, they need to go on again. Yep. Uh, when you had mentioned about so many barrels of you know, different whales, um, was there a standard for how many you know, gallons or whatever? What was the capacity of a, of a typical barrel? One barrel is 31.5 gallons.
it could be anywhere from, so it's, say it's a Provincetown voyage to uh, humpbacking on the coast of Cuba. Uh, they could be out for a year. Uh, a sperm whaling voyage, uh, or let's say a, um, let's say even more significant, a, uh, a, a bowhead voyage to the Western Arctic. They could be gone for five years. And they could be gone for a long time. Yeah. No, the, the Western Arctic? Well, in the Eastern Arctic, that fishery goes as far back as the, as the early 17th century. And even earlier than that, Laps and Samoyed people in Siberia had been hunting whales up there. Eskimos, of course, have been hunting whales forever, thousands of years. Um, the Eastern Arctic fishery began in the early 17th century around 1602 and continued right up into the middle of the 18th century and even past that. So uh, by the, even into the 1850s, Scottish steam powered, steam assisted um, sailing ships, big steamers from Scotland, from Dundee um, and uh, 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 Peterhead were cruising into uh, Hudson's Bay, the Davis Straits and the Western Greenland to hunt bowhead whales. Americans penetrated the Western Arctic. Uh, it was Thomas Welcome Royce of Sag Harbor um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the ship Enterprise of Sag Harbor about 1848 is when he actually penetrated uh, Bering Strait. And then after that, it was a bonanza. Um, and I've seen uh, references. It's the most extraordinary thing. It was, a, it was a vessel that was in the Bering Straits and he said, he write, the guy writes in his journal, 60 sail in sight this day. 60 vessels were in sight in the Bering Straits. Yes, sir? What would be the capacity and barrel for a boat? And what would be their sizes for the boat? Well, that's a great question, too. Um, you know, again, you know, a Provincetown schooner of, uh, you know, the, uh, of 90 tons, um, you know, he, he, they'd be lucky if they'd return 200 barrels. Uh, 300 barrels at the uh, you know on the outside, you know a big um, you know a big ship, and, a, and in the whale fishery a really really big ship was 500 tons. Uh, a big ship, you know of 350 or 400 tons could return 2,300 to 3,000 barrels full. Somewhere between oh the animals themselves. Yeah, it could be, uh, you know, on average, uh, we figured about 40 whales uh, would fill up uh, an average voyage. And some uh, took many more than that, and some uh, fewer. So on average, like, a, you know, about 40, 40, 45 animals. Yes, sir. There were bowhead whales that were made 300 barrels of oil. That's a big, fat bowhead whale. What did they do with the oil? With the oil? Uh, it was <laughs> sperm oil and, and spermaceti was processed into um, fine burning fuel, uh, fine burning oils, uh, fine lubricants and candles. Um, humpback and right whale and bowhead oil uh, was processed into poorly burning uh, uh, lighting uh, and lubricants of various kinds, especially for uh, locomotives, for screw cutting, for metal work. Uh, whale oil really did lubricate the Industrial Revolution. No two ways about that. Yep. Yes, sir. Um, when you were talking about navigation, it sounded like you were saying that these early mariners were uh, rowing or maybe the chairs. What I thought was that the navigation was through ships. I always thought that you know the trade winds and different routes were trying to keep them themselves. Whaling grounds were kept secret. But, you know, when Matthew Fontaine Maury uh, and Lieutenant Maury, when he began to compile the wind and current charts in 1849 and 1850, 
he actually had a kind of a journal that he would give to anybody who would take it that, he, that they could keep track of this information that he wanted to publish because when, Mar when Matthew Fontaine Maury was all done compiling all of the whaling logbooks and journals that he could find, compiling all of the naval ve uh, voyages that he could find from logbooks and journals, all of the merchant voyages that he could get his hands on, he was actually able to determine exactly what route a vessel should take in order to get from point A to point B with, uh, the most efficiently. So Maury's wind and current charts uh, really were an important breakthrough. Yeah. Yes, sir. Whoop, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure of the answer to that question because, you know, gray whales give birth in uh, in uh, uh, Baja, um, in uh, in the Sea of Cortez, and that's very warm water. <coughs> right whales give birth um, very often uh, in the Labrador um, current. Um, you know, which is, you know, up off of Nova Scotia, which is very cold water, and bowhead whales, of course, live in the Arctic. Sperm whales uh, give birth all, all over the world. Yes, sir. No, it's just the opposite. Really? Yeah, and just the. the natives always seem to, when they take an animal, they, they offer it up. They have a sense of we'll use all of it, and I just was kind of heartbroken that nobody ever said, "Hey, you know, this is a nice place to take this animal. This unit is big." That is one of the most fascinating differences between commercial and subsistence whalers. Yeah. Is that subsistence whalers? have a, a, a visceral connection to their prey. They have little talismans uh, that they mount on their boats. They give thanks to the animal for giving itself. There's a belief among the Eskimos in particular that the animals give themselves to the hunters. And that if the, a hunter takes an animal, it's because the animal wants to be taken. And they propitiate the spirit of that animal. There's all kinds of ritual that the Northwest Coast Native people used to go through um, that was kind of lost through time, but that there was all sorts of things. Women weren't allowed anywhere near the beach. They weren't allowed to talk to the whalemen for a week before they go out. Um, the whalemen themselves had to wear certain kinds of clothes. They couldn't bathe for three days before they went out. I mean, there's, there's a whole kind of, of uh, important um, uh, ritualistic um, kind of behavior that went into uh, that went into the hunt uh, from a, from subsistence whalers um, and you know uh, that's not the capitalist way mate just another question uh, I'm sorry oh, yeah no, that's okay go ahead I, I find it fascinating it's like why do you think this part of our history never got captured I, that's a great question I don't know why I think it has much this much to do with the same reason that the answer to that, we're capitalists. We don't have time for this. There's no time for art. What are you, nuts? There's no time for that. You know, I mean, this is private stuff. You know, these guys would record their stuff in their journals, and, uh, and that was their private experience. They would engrave scrimshaw. They would give it to their wives, to their kids, you know. Uh, but, you know, William Roach doesn't care if you draw in your journal or not. And William Roach couldn't care less if, if, if there's ever a picture of whaling. It, it, that, that, that's not going to, you know, help him any. Um, you know, his, the bottom line there is that, you know, he, they're making money. And, and, you know, the Dutch somehow seem to have had, and the Japanese seem to have had a much different relationship to their, to their fishery. There's a lot of Dutch art. And a lot of it was 
agents commissioned artists to um, to paint grand, I mean, grand oil paintings, you know, Asias Vandevelder and, and Ludolf Backhausen. I mean, these guys are, these are major artists, you know, and they're painting these, these scenes. Now, Benjamin Russell, interestingly enough, Benjamin Russell made a living painting whaling pictures and whaling ships for, on commission. So he was one of the few who did. There weren't a lot, um, but he was one. Yes, ma'am. The very last the Yankee voyage was the schooner John R. Manta of New Bedford in 1827, 1927, I'm sorry, and it, um, it went to the Hatteras Grounds, um, which were the earliest and last whaling ground, Hatteras Grounds off of Virginia. Yeah. Well, the Cape Corey was built uh, in Westport, Massachusetts. It was a hermaphrodite brig. Um, it was built to the order of, of uh, uh, Isaac Corey, uh, I believe it was Isaac uh, Corey, uh, who was a whaling agent and grocer and the postmaster of Westport. And uh, the Cape Corey whaled a uh, number of voyages, I believe she was, it was built in 1850, 1851, and she was lost uh, during the Civil War. Um, the the uh, Alabama sank the Cape Corey. Why do you ask about the Cape Corey? Yeah. Well, the, re the reason that there's any model of the Cape Corey at all is that Richard Kugler, who was director of the New Bedford Whaling Museum from 1968 till 1984, was a Corey. <laughs> he was a Corey. He was a Corey. And he had, uh, he had Eric Ronberg. He commissioned Eric Ronberg to build a model of the Cape Corey. And so we had this beautiful model of this completely inconsequential whaling vessel. Uh, and uh, and so there were there were plans made from that. So that's great. I'm glad to hear you made. Yes, sir. One last question. You said the last one, uh, the right date of the Cape Corey. Oh, yeah. You really want to go there? <laughs> <laughs> the short short answer is yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. In the very back. There were absolutely wives and children on, on, uh, at sea in the whale fishery. Uh, they were sometimes welcome, mostly not. Um, but uh, but th that entire story has been very well told. There's a number of excellent books on, uh, on the history of, of uh, women at sea in the whale fishery. You guys are great. Thank you.